Hello and welcome to Play Pause Turn. In this podcast, we discuss all things to do with TV, films, games and literature. We give our thoughts on the media we've been enjoying, old or new, and comment on anything topical. Our hosts today are uh, Alex, Mark and myself. And I do have an intro question, which I'm going to drop on both both guests here because um, they weren't expecting this. But here we go. Speaking of dropping. Um, Mark, if you were dropped into an alternate universe, what would it be like? Oh, my God. Uh, right. I have to remember this is a clean podcast. Um, so I would my universe would be have quite a lot of booze in a lot of food. But everyone could just do what they want and say what they want and just be happy. It would be a happy world, I think. We wouldn't want any um, any nastiness or anything this, like this, it. it. This w- sounds like Elon Musk's pitch for Twitter, Mark. By the way, yeah, it does. Just to see, no. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, mine would be a expression of ideas and debate and fun. Oh, okay. You throw me there. I could go filthier, but I won't. This is no, a family no. podcast, so <laughs> yeah, I won't. Don't. That's fine. <laughs> Alex, how about this you? Is, this is a, an, an alternative real universe, not fantasy. So, so No, thing, yes, yes. Which, although that, that, that concept is very loose in the multiverse, like, like there's a lot of it that doesn't sound very real. But anyway, um, I think I would, I loved the idea of opposites. So I would love to see opposites, maybe... Uh, opposites where uh, women were more more um, what was the word um, dominant dominant than dominant the gender. men and how that changed things. I'm not sure. I'm not looking for Handmaiden Tale though. I'm just looking for. So for... that was my idea, but you said it a bit more yeah. cleaner though. Yeah, well, yeah, but, but I'm not no, looking but I don't for think anything. When, when Alex is saying just... dominant women, he's not meaning that sort of dominant women, Mark. No, no, yeah, yeah. no, no. But like but no, actually, no. I take it all back because I'm not sure whether I'd no. like that. Um, but yeah, no, no, it's just some something something different would be good for me. So any opposites would be nice. Okay, well, I, I, obviously we're talking about um, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness here. So um, having seen a particular scene in the film, which I won't spoil yet, but I quite like to have an entire. So here's here's my pitch: um, an entire universe where everything looks exactly the same. Okay, but everything is made. Um, as realistically possible out of Lego. So it's not oh, like the Lego movie, yeah. but you know when you go into Legoland and there's like a statue of um, Hans, what, Hans, is it Hans Christian Andersen outside the front in Denmark? I think it is. I think um, it is, yeah. But it's, you know, you know when you see these rather large statues that where they're like sort of sculptures of real things. So imagine everything being realistically representable in Lego. I just think that'd be really interesting. I'm not sure how we'd move and eat, but there you go. Um, yeah. I thought it would be good as well, just as you just kind of... Sc- like um, I put this on us a little bit, and we'll go into the film. If everything in this world was the reverse in another one, so like a traffic light, if you stop, it's obviously red. But like, if you want to, like, but like, stop is green. So I like, think of everything that we do everyday lives, right? But everything is the reversal. That could yeah. be quite fun. I think that'd be quite difficult, but it'd be quite fun. Nice. I actually read I read a book, um, a science fiction book uh, about some scientists who somehow punch a hole in the multiverse to a world where um, <clears throat> the dominant species was not, not um, Homo sapiens, but Neanderthalis, Humanus Neanderthalis. So the, the, the Neanderthals actually made it through rather than humans. Mm-hmm. And so a scientist from the Neanderthal side sort of takes a human round their world. And at one point they're in a car and he's surprised by the car stopping on a green light and moving on a red. And the Neanderthal reason for that was that um, green represents all things rotting and disgusting in, in nature, like gangrene, and red represents the clean, pure blood, or you know, the safe human, safe Neanderthal blood. That was their rationale for red being go and green being stopped. So whenever I, when I saw that in the film, which isn't too much of a spoiler, I think no, that's the not. first thing I thought of was that book. That's I what you thought about the book, mm. which is neat. Not an, not an original idea, but quite an interesting idea. The book is actually called Hominids, the Neanderthal Parallax One, by an author called Robert J. Sawyer. And I think you can get it as a book and an audiobook, um, just in case you're wondering. Yeah. Okay, so we're, 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 again, we're going to be very careful about spoilers to begin with. Um, so if you are listening to this and you haven't seen a film, we are going to spoil it in a bit. Um, we'll give you a bit of a chance for us to just our general thoughts and then obviously go back to this when you watch the film. 
Gentlemen, just your general thoughts on the film. Um, obviously, uh, if you've heard our previous podcast, this is episode 24, essentially, because our little um, sp- spoiler cast, the first thoughts that we recorded in the actual cinema, um, that's previous to this one. But um, perhaps we start with Mark on this one. What was your general feeling on the film, Mark, without spoiling it? So I really enjoyed the film. Um, when I was watching it, I definitely got Infinity War vibes from it. And... Infinity War is my probably my favourite MCU film. Um, I always feel the best Marvel films are the ones that are able to kind of combine action, humour, character development, and a story all in one. It kind of it's not just one thing; it it blends them all. And so I think that's why I liked this as well. Um, I liked it for several reasons. I thought some of the performances were excellent, which we'll get into. I thought some of the action set pieces were really good. I thought some of the surprises were also really good. But I think it's, it's got a real heart to it. Um, and again, I don't want to spoil anything, but the best villains are the ones where you can kind of sympathise with or see their point of view at very least. And I think that's very strong on this. And that's what I liked about it. So for me, I really enjoyed it. And I think it's got a combination of everything that really makes it really well. And being a fan of Sam Raimi and his films, you can kind of see the same. Um, you can also also see the Sam Raimi sort of like bits in this where he gets to put his own sort of stamp on it as well, which I really enjoyed. So overall, I loved it. Yeah, it was really good for me. Mm. It's, it's interesting because um, the, the films that have, that draw in a lot of the characters from the Marvel universe, um, they they seem to me to be more the most like uh, representing the comic. If that makes sense. In that, you know, the comics had a lot of characters coming in every so often, didn't they? Obviously, you get you get your you know your arcs with the single characters, but a lot of the Marvel yeah. Universe comics very much had, you know, a lot, of, and that's why I think a lot of these kind of multi-character event films are so popular. I think. Um, yeah, because and, it is like sorry, in, 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 sorry, it is like yeah. watching a live-action comic. If that makes sense as mm. well. Which is what I want from a comic book movie. I want, like, I want lots of different things from it. But the watching like a live motion comic, if that makes sense, you know, live action comic is what I want, and this is what this gives you. So that's why I, I think I like it quite a lot as well. Alex, any thoughts from you? Um, yeah, well, I completely chime with most of what Mark said. I think the best way to describe this is a. Um, is an action comedy horror film like you could put all of those things things together and and that's what they've that's what they've done um yeah it's a it's a really good film a lot happens it's it's packed from start to finish um yeah it still has time to develop its characters get you um you know to to um uh, relate to them um, and understand their backstory because there's some new characters that you need to understand. Um, it works really hard to do that, whilst also um, being able to throw sort of rip up a lot of the previous um, uh, Marvel universe, um, mash up some of the the comics, uh, the uh, and, and really bring some of the really interesting bits of the comics uh, together. Um, and I just love the way that it's interwoven with some of the uh, previous films, uh, particularly, we'll talk about it, but particularly WandaVision uh, and What If. Um, I think I think the way that it wove those in um, really, really um, uh, worked very well. And it meant that as you as you had the film you really really get you know if you're a geek and you want like watched a lot of of of, of the uh films and and the, the the tv shows you would see the references that they bring in and you'd really enjoy that um and i think sam raimi brings a really interesting um slant on on marvel um and it's really nice that he gets to include some of his horror pieces um and we'll talk a bit that more about that um, later on, but it, it kind of it really added to the film. Not it didn't it didn't distract detract from it, um, and it really added and made it a, a much more powerful film. So it was really good, and I very difficult to say anything bad about it because it's, yeah. it's really really um, positive. So I'm just trying to find the runtime. Was it about two hours and fifteen film? Um, 
Yeah, I, 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 think I so. felt. I felt. I think it was about I, I two hours five. Yeah. Thing. See how uh, long is it? Sorry. It's about two hours five minutes. See, I didn't feel yeah, the right. length of it. You didn't th- because, um, as you say, there's so much going on, isn't there? I thought the pace was really interesting. This film, it was, it was very much. It felt like a roller coaster. Yeah, uh, and that's I think because you. you know, oh, sorry, gone. Well, I mean, there's a lot of locations and different places and different and a lot of you know cuts to this scene and cuts to this scene. So, um, I think I think it will definitely keep a certain demographic very much engaged and interested. And I think the. Um, Disney now know, they know um, what is successful in a Marvel film. They, they, you know, they've 25 odd films now. Um, I, I, I still think uh, it has its flaws. Uh, we may discuss those. I mean, they're, they're minor ones, but I still think there are areas to work on. But um, yeah, I really enjoyed it as well. Um, and I do like Benedict Cumberbatch. I think he's, um, Cumberbatch, sorry. He's a, he's a very compelling character. Um, uh, and as you say, the cast were very good. The, the new characters and the old and the old established ones were really good. So um, I can see both Alex and Mark here are busting to talk about it even more. So we will go into um, spoiler territory now. So if you haven't seen the film, go and watch it, obviously. Um, but let's talk about um, initially. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on later on to basically do the Mark interview and use Mark as a personal Google about the law. But we'll come back to that in a second. But just on the general narrative of the story. Um, uh, Alex, I'll go to you first. Um, how, what are your thoughts now? Now we've had a time to think about it since we've seen it, uh, and possibly do a bit of research ourselves. What are your general thoughts on on the film itself, and in terms um, of the the story, how it links back from the previous TV series and films, and going forward? What, what are your thoughts? So I think, um, I think it's really well crafted in terms of how it fits things in, uh, and I think, in a way, the whole idea of the multiverse gives does give them a little bit of a pass to kind of link things in that didn't really link and and retcon things if they needed to um and what i find surprising is that actually they didn't need to retcon uh, much at all because actually they because this was so well planned it, it linked in so well so and we'll talk about wanda in a bit um but what was nice about it was you know it reinforced everything that you saw rather than saying oh actually we've solved that by doing this thing which can be a bit frustrating, you know, when you, they you get a lot conflicts. of those um, issues and problems with the Star Wars yeah. uh, narratives. And, all, and there's a lot of articles at the moment saying they've fixed this problem with the, you know, with Anakin and um, Obi Wan Kenobi. Right. They've fixed this problem, and I think, uh, well, at the moment as we talk, Kevin Feige is off in some log cabin somewhere with a few um, Marvel execs, sort of planning out the next ten years of the Marvel universe. Mm. And I imagine that's probably what they did a while ago for all the films we're currently seeing. So phase so four, do, yeah intertwine so successfully together uh, you know and how i mean how do you feel about essentially this, the tv series wandavision being a preamble to this so this all works are you happy with that i am i think it worked yeah. really well because the thing is and and the, what where marvel worked nicely was it it gets to tell its story about the character um and give it the right amount of um you know levity to do, go away and tell its story um whilst continue continually thinking and that should link to that and that should link to that now the the real difference for this one is that that happens not just at the start or at the end it happens throughout the entire film so entire throughout the entire film they've gone oh well we're going to introduce um the these people because we already talked about them here or or mm. we alluded to this here or we explored this a little bit but we didn't get enough time to and that was great because it it kind of really gave it a depth that a lot of films don't. A lot of the time, they 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 pick something up, go and tell their other character's story, and then come back and and say, oh, and that's how it links in. Um, and I think that that's what was good about this was it it didn't do do that once. It did that throughout the entire film. Mm. So you got the payoff each time that you had that introduction or each time you heard that reference or whatever. And I think that was really good because normally you wait, you can wait, you know, the entire film to go, all right, but are they going to mention so-and-so or, you know, an entire series by, but, but saying, you know, where is, um, What's the word? Captain where's Marvel. where is all of yeah. you know? Where's where's all of um? All the galaxy people. Gal- you know, yeah, exactly. And you spent all people. this time going, where are they? Where are they? And what was good about this was that it said, you know, 
here's these people and it didn't say we're getting to this it told the story and introduced them which was what was nice because then you actually were like hey they didn't forget it they didn't just tease it they actually brought them in and it really knitted in really well it felt really well done as we've mentioned before they've, they've got the um poetic license here to completely disregard a lot of the previous characters without feeling like you're, you're binning them because we're going into alternate realities yeah um and um as you probably heard from our last podcast everybody um there was a lot of clapping and applauding every so often as new characters appeared and characters that people would wish to see appeared and characters that have been alluded to in the trailers appeared yeah um and i think that was um clever my only my only concern is is are we going to have um sort of uh, branching off and diverting stories that become a little bit trickier to understand if we keep delving deeper into the multiverse um we'll come to that later on with um with our uh, feel Marvel like, guru mark but, yeah uh, i feel like this was a little bit of an exception but let's let, let's go on because i think this felt more like uh an avengers film in yeah. a way than it did um a, a film about strange um okay that mark oh Let's, let's go to Mark. What are your thoughts on the general storyline and just going through the film? Yeah, I mean, I think what it did actually quite well was probably for the first time since we've had the these, excuse me, uh, since we had the Disney Plus shows is that it gives the Disney Plus shows more weight. I think that there is an argument, probably because the films haven't gone into them too much yet, that the Disney Plus shows could be seen as quite disposable. You know, you don't really have to watch them if you don't want to sort of thing, you know. And although I quite enjoyed, like, a few of them, you know, I've got Netflix with them as well. But I think this one elevates, like, One Division. I think, absolutely. Like, I enjoyed One Division. I thought it was really good. Um, but this does elevate, because it is essentially, I mean, this film, there is, like, as Alex just said, there are parts of, obviously, like, Doctor Strange's character development in it, but it is also very much a sequel to One Division as well. And I think it's quite good that they're able to blend both. The fact that, that this is a Doctor Strange sequel, where you're developing him, plus you're using elements from one division into one film, I think that really enhances the film. And I think it's going to actually enhance the MCU as well. The fact that you can do like, oh, like more than thing at once, you know, the Doctor Strange film doesn't have to always be about Doctor Strange, you know, or anything like that. You know, it's, it's going to take elements from the greater universe, I think, and use them. And that is certainly what I got from this, you know. Like, I think you can watch this film without having seen One Division, but I do think having seen One Division does absolutely help in, in this as well. Mm. But in regards to the story, again, when we talked about, like, our thoughts and what we, like, thought about it as well, you know, the best villains are the one that you sympathise with where you can see their point of view. And I think this does this really well. Are we into spoilers yet? Yes. Are we doing spoilers? Yes. We are. Right. So the thing I, I like with Wonder and their children, right? I mean, I've I've always looked at it, like, since watching One Division, my sort of um, opinion of her or how I think that she's evolved is since Endgame is that she's grief-stricken at the loss of Vision. She's also lost her brother as well um, in Quicksilver, obviously in Age of Ultron as well. So she suffered a lot of loss, which is again is looked at in in one division as well. And I think that, like I looked at it, is that this is a person who's just broken. Who is so like has lost everything really in that. You know, she's lost you know the person that she loves. She's lost her brother. She doesn't know her purpose in the world. She has these powers. And a lot of the power, which again is on one division, is she's learning how to use that and to see what else that she can do. And I think that she's just a character that is very traumatized. I, I don't want to say mental health because I think that belittles the real sort of issues in the world. But they've certainly used this is someone who is broken and is desperate for connection, someone who's desperate for love, and someone who's really desperate for a happy ending, really. And she feels like she, like she has to have this, and she wants this at any cost. And I think that goes into the dark hold as well. You know, at the end of One Division, she gets that from Agnes, and and the dark hold has corrupted her in this film. You know, like when we first see her in the film, when Strange is talking to her, and it's revealed that she's like in brackets, I like the enemy in this one. Like she's. 
you can see it from her point of view. She's like, why can't I have my happy ending? You know, she said, there's a great line that's in the trailer and, and in the film, you know, she's just a strange, it's like you changed the universe or you changed something, you know, you're the hero, I do it and I'm the villain. That doesn't seem fair. For, and that's from her point of view. Mm. And I like that. And, and the fact that she's, so consumed by wanting her children back, she'll do anything, and it, it veers her off onto a very, very dark path. But you can see a, a point in there for her, you know, where you've, she has gone so f through so much, and you, and you do think, oh, God, just give her a happy well, ending, I mean, you know, give you her look, a break. You look at her childhood and how you know, her family, yes, it, or yeah, a happy family, you, yes, exactly. you know, with, yeah. with the bombing of uh, her house, and then war and her comes, family yeah. being killed. I mean, she's not had a great, yeah. great time, has she really? So you can, you, as you no. say, you can sympathise with her motivations. Um, mm. and, and I found it, I mean, at the time when I watched the film, I felt a little bit put out that she changed her mind so quickly at the end, um, when she devoted all this energy to bringing demons to chase um, America. But I think... Uh, on on no, just think mulling it over afterwards. I can also see how sometimes that can be that that turnaround can be an epiphany in someone's life, and actually, oh, hold on, you know, maybe I have done the wrong thing, and here's here's a better solution. Leave the family to the loving mother already. Um, I, my, my my one question to you, Mark, is why why wasn't um, because Wanda is such a powerful witch. And because I don't think she draws her magic from the Dark Universe, does she? No, no. So her, is that reason um, why the Dark Hole does not corrupt her in any way, uh, you know, physically, like it does Doctor Strange? Yeah, so because she's a Nexus, so in the comic law, yeah. so she's a Nexus being. So uh, this is so obviously in the comic, she's a mutant, which obviously when she was created in the MCU was when they didn't have to. I like the rights to the term mutant at the time. Sure. So in the MCU, her power is derived from the Infinity Stones. Obviously, because you see her being tested on in um, in Ultron, and yeah. I think it was the pre-credits of Winter Soldier, I think. So her origin is slightly different in the MCU to um, in the comics. In the comics, she's just a mutant, and she's, um, she's on the same level as Jean Grey, for example. But obviously, in this, her power is derived from the Infinity Stones she was tested on. And the dark hold uh, so because she's a witch though like, in essence her power is that it's a bit like uh, like the dark hold just sort of influences you and goes on, obviously for a dark path a bit like strange does at the end when we see him with the three eyes and we'll get into that as well i mean the idea of the dark hold is that it just it absolutely corrupts it doesn't make you know it, it it doesn't matter who you are like if captain america used it you know or Superman use a dark hole, they would still be corrupted by it as well. So that is the idea behind it. So you can have the most purest intentions and uh, and the right way to go about it, but it will ultimately still corrupt you as well. Mm. So so that's why it does it to her. So it, it draws, so it makes her less rational already in, in like a very vulnerable position. You know, in a way, it's kind of like the symbiote in Venom, you know, like with Spider-Man, you know, like it, it takes a hold of your, like, uh, uh, your weaknesses and boosts you up, you know, it, it takes a hold of you and corrupts you, which is exactly what that is. I mean, she was a good person originally, and I wonder if her, for her, the corruption is not physical, it's it's mental. Yeah, it's mental, yeah. Alex, but, you got you got something on this. Oh, sorry. Well, no, the, the thing is, the way I see it is, yes, there's a corruption element um, for, from the dark magic, but... The other part of it is, if you think about WandaVision, WandaVision is um, really the story of her grief getting over Vision, and and this in this particular in this film, it's about the grief over losing her sons, because the thing is that she hadn't Im imagined and vision and that until WandaVision, and and now it, it, you know that's where the um, the dreams with with her kids plus the dark hold have. Mm have 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 um uh, corrupted her and so you end up in this it almost in repeating what she had to go through with vision with her kids um so yeah mm. that's the way i saw that's the way i saw it um but yeah no i can understand the difference between the the the, the uh, her magic and the dark hold i, I get i get that okay 
Well, that's that's. I mean, now that we're talking, sort of diving deep into the law here, I think maybe we should um, pump at our mark for more information. Alex, do you have any <laughs> any particular queries or questions you want to ask Mark about so, about the film? What's confused you or made you think more? I do. I mean, we dealt in a little bit into Wanda already. Um, mm. I don't. I'm not sure how many Wanda comics you've read, but I wonder how how um, sort of faithful this interpretation is versus the comics uh, of of Wanda. Not 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 strange, because mm. um, obviously the first part of it really is a story about Wanda. It's not about you know the 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 other, the other characters are almost secondary. Um, then I think as we get on, I really want to talk a bit more about the future and and how. Um, uh, America is 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 part of this, but but for what for Wanda, what what are your thoughts? Uh, me, so um, I mean, in regards to this story, they take a lot of elements from a comic called The House of M. Mm-hmm. So The House of M is a uh, it's quite a seminal story in modern day law as well. So in <clears throat> excuse me, so she becomes because of her mutation and her power. She becomes more and more powerful in the comics, and that lends into her delusions, and it lends into like a mental state to the extent where she like magics up children. So the children are never real. So she doesn't actually have children in the comics. But what happens is that her magic sort of conjures these up, and they actually there's a there's an uncovered story, but but then somehow the children become actual beings as well. But there's a long way to that as well. But certainly all about the children and their grief and their wanting a family is very much derived from the house vex. Um, the big... What didn't happen in this, which I didn't think was going to happen, was there's uh, the house of X leads on a massive cliffhanger. Sorry, as you made, house of X, uh, right, Dean by the, X, as in X-Men. Right, so, that, yeah. is that a precursor so, to him then, is it? Yeah, so the House of X, so it ends on the cliffhanger wherein she says no more mutants. She utters these words and because her powers are reality altering powers, she actually kills about 85% of mutants in the comics and there's only a very few small amount of mutants left as well. So really she decimates like a whole, like the whole population of mutants. I think it's only like Wolverine and a few others sort of like uh, like survive for that. Obviously they don't do this here because I've not got into X Men just yet as well. But it's uh but this certainly pulls from House of X though, mm-hmm. like a lot of the um um a lot of the story. Mm. No, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I have read House of M. Um but it's mm. it's quite confusing House of M, sorry not yeah, X sorry. I have read House of M but it's quite confusing when because it's kind of, you can when you when you read it it's kind of in the middle of an arc, isn't it? Um, it, yes. it opens with the birth of the twins um, uh, and wanders in bed and uh, it's all like happy and then it suddenly changes as um, Xavier comes in and says um, Wanda you're, 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 off your, you're off your nut love you know, these don't exist yeah. um, so she just to preempt that as well yeah. so in the comic the, like the before that she's actually uh, so when that starts she's in Genosha which is a fictional country which is supposed to be like a haven for mutants but she's actually destroyed you know she, um like due to her her powers and mental state and that's when it goes into house of m after that as well but yes it is um so she's actually destroyed a country before she's even got into that as well i mean so she's uh, again they, they make they, they do make a point of how powerful she is mm. and i have questions yeah, about, she's a mega level yeah i yeah. have questions about the ending as well which we'll come to um so let's talk about America Chavez, played by um, Soshi, uh, is it Soshi Gomez, I think her name is, mm-hmm. the actress. Um, so she, I've never seen this character before. Is she an established character in the Marvel comics or is she a new character created for this film? No, she's a, uh, she's a character. It's actually quite, I think this is the first instance in the MCU where this is a character that was created in the comics after the MCU started. Oh really, she's a new character the M- then? Yeah, so the MCU started in 2008 with Iron Man, and America Chavez was only created in 2011. Right. So she's quite a new character in the comics, and I've not actually read that much of her. What's, I do know her backstory. What's her I've read superhero the name in the comics, then? Oh, Miss America. I knew you tell me that. 
Yeah, Miss America. Miss America. Yeah. Alex, yeah. Yeah, Miss America, yeah. So it's Miss America. Right. Yeah. Though she appeared first in the comic series called Vengeance. Um, but there are some bits that are interesting about that because obviously, I mean, it's a completely new backstory that we've, we we obviously need to delve into a bit more. Um, but she could be one of the first young Avengers. Yeah. And we'll, we might want to talk through that. Oh, mm. Okay. Because there's reference to a Young Avengers in uh, the Winter Soldier TV series as well, isn't there? Mm. Yes. Um, gosh. And and in Hawkeye as well. Yeah, so many threads. Um, and in Gang. <laughs> and in Gang. So, uh, <laughs> see, see, this, this is why we, we, we've got you here, Mark, so we can sort of clear these yeah. things up for us. Um, see, when I when I watched the trailers for this film, I was convinced that the... Yes, Wanda was in it, but the bad guy was going to be... Um, an alternate version of Doctor Strange rampaging through the universe to kind of as his phone. Yeah. An interesting idea is him battling himself in this, and he kind of does. He he kind of battles his reputation a little bit, doesn't he? He's Doctor Strange is de- dealing yeah. with how others think about him, and in some respects, I mean, the the, the central um, theme here is that uh, America thinks that at some point he's going to um, sacrifice her for the greater good. Because obviously she 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 goes through that process and he dreams it, um, which happens to be a, a window into other universes. According to this film, that fills mm-hmm. me with horror when you think about what people can dream up. But there you go. Um, but that's so clever, isn't yeah. it? Like imagine like all the dreams you've had are actually like other like like other iterations of yourself well, I mean, in different. Te- oh, technically, like, that's a great idea. Mark, if you want to get metaphysical here, technically, um, if you believe in multiverse theory, and a lot of people do. Uh, if we live in a world of infinite universes, then every single fathomable idea is a possibility that has occurred or will occur in an infinite number of universes. Do you see? Yeah, so yeah it's still got to be true because it's, it's in true. So, yeah. And you know, so, uh, yeah, exactly. That's, that's why. Um, and Brian Aldiss, um, in his novel *Stranger in a Strange Land*, explored this to the point where his characters um, actually jumped to other books that he'd written. Um, and ref- he referred to his own books and characters from other books became universes and it, it became uh, in some respects all, all this I think it was all this Stranger in a Strange Land yeah. well, you can fact check for me please Alex um, he um, he he kind of came up with the idea of the multiverse in, this, in, in a similar style to Marvel before everyone else with with the fun sort of bringing in other characters you know and alternate characters in um, so yeah it's a very fantastical story, but I think it's it's based on a, a loose reality that we could could believe in, really. That's why it makes this film so much fun. Um, mm. Now, another law question for you, Mark, and I'm sure when we and we've discussed this twice before. Um, at some point, when we can stream this this film and watch it in the comfort of our own rooms, we're all going to pause on that that scene where Strange and America are falling through multiple universes and doing weird things and in fact if you look yes. at uh, one of the variant covers for house of m um wonder on the front of one of the variant covers for house of m her face is pulling apart into cubes yes and i wonder if which that, is in the, yeah. which is homage to that i wonder yes. is that is that a direct reference to it, is it I, I, yeah it's just a homage to it as well yeah, yeah. so that yeah so that cover is brought by brian michael uh, is by brian michael bendez Who's a famous X Men artist as well? Yeah, that cover is just like a cover. It doesn't really mean anything as well. But certainly, uh, when you see that happen to Strange going through the multiverse, that is a direct nod to House of M as well. It's a nice. Little the, nod actually, to the it cover. Well. The, the, you're talking about the writer Bendis. Bendis is the writer. The, the cover. Oh, Bendis is the writer. Yeah, sorry. the variant cover yes. was by a guy called Joe Kizada. Sorry, um, yeah, Joe, yes. sorry, it was Bendis who wrote it. Sorry, yeah. yes. So but, um, I've got. So, so I have a list, by the way. <laughs> of, of all the uh, places, it, it it's not all the detail yet, but there is there is a list around there, and they basically say that they go through about sixteen universes in that sequence. Right, come on then, come on then. So let's, let's it says, it. Um, uh, there we go. So um, entered reality in the MCU version of the Living Tribunal uh, before jumping to a world made of crystals, followed by a forest filled with giant flying bugs. Then they found themselves underwater with all sorts of sea creatures before being greeted uh, by a jungle with battling dinosaurs. Yeah, that's in the uh, trailer continu- as well. Yeah, continuing through a reality where their bodies started separating into cubes. Then they turned into multicoloured blobs of paint 
The other realities included an old timey universe with zeppelins and old fashioned cars. And it, it um, had it actually had a like a, an old timey scratchy effect on the film as well, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it looked amazing. Looked really I wonder good. if that's a reference to um the noir universe. I think you know, there are mm, references to Spider Man sure. Spider Noir. Yeah. Um, a reality sorry. with giant pillars, um, and what might have been Stonehenge, a world of volcano volcanoes, one made of tubes, one featuring dark smoke with violins two representing futuristic cities, one made uh, entirely of large skeletons and one resembling a 60s to 70s era comic book art, which was the one where it looked very... Um, I mean, look, almost... I, I really wanted them to kind Spider-verse. of... Spider-verse. Do the Spider-verse, but actually they can't. Yeah. So um, uh, no. I, I, I think this was a nod to the Sony? comic. Yeah. Yeah. But right. yeah, and, you know, completely it's Sony. Sony. But, um, but also I think it was nice that they put a nod to the comics... Because it's mm. it was again this is this whole film is is a a love letter to to the the variety of comics um, and that kind of thing and obviously you know that's what the story is all about really isn't it all the multiverse um, so yeah no I love so I love that um, and then there are more the, uh, but we, we didn't sorry. we we cover those as as we go through the film yeah so the world with the dinosaurs and I like all the green that could be a nod to the Savage Land yes it is which yeah. is yeah, yeah, it's part of the X Men mm-hmm. lore. That's right. Yeah, and the Living Tribunal. Uh, that is so. Yeah, that's the, the thing. That's the first one they go mm-hmm. into, and and you see the heads of the Living Tribunal. Yes. As so, well. what's the Living Tribunal? I, so, in the comics, the Living Tribunal is kind of like, um, it's like the ones who create like the world. So that would lean more into Eternals. So you know, Eternals they talk about you know. That they create them, don't they? And they create life, etc. As well. Yeah. So the Living Tribunal was kind of like a step up from that, where they like ruled and they made decisions on like all life as well. It gets very, very meta as well. So, but the Living Tribunal is kind of like an extension of the Eternals as well. They they, so, so. they kind of use him as they use them as a um, method of fixing like some of the plot ch- challenges that you have when you you do the comics all the time. So they kind of right. sometimes yeah. they kind of go right. Let's go to the living tribunal they they'll sort this out and then the the tribunal says something and then that's what happens so and are they do they They are like in the comics they're like a very useful mcguffin really to be honest you know so if you want to reset a time sorry interrupting john so like if the comics go somewhere and another artist doesn't want to do it you can use the tribunal to change it a little bit it's a little out like to be honest in that you know so you can change things if that's not the way you want to go. So it is like a big MacGuffin. So they're not related they to the Watchers or anything? Not really. If anything, the Watchers would work for them. Yeah, that's what I thought. So the Living Tribunal is very, very powerful, but they are a very helpful MacGuffin for the writers as well, basically, yeah. Well, okay. I think I'm more uh, educated than I was before. Um, it, does, <laughs> I mean, it, does, it does make you realise how much, how much material... Marvel have to work from, and how actually, yeah. how uh, bewildering it must be for the writers to kind of have to sort of nip and tuck here and, and bring seams together to to make it all work, and also keep you know the diehard comic fans happy. It's quite a job they have, really. Mm. Um, a bit yeah. of a mixed blessing where you have got lots of material, but also like treasure, treasure, treasure material you have to deal with. So I don't envy their job. Um, okay, let's let's talk about. Um, again, we discussed this slightly in our, um, our first thoughts podcast, but now we have Mark here. Let's talk about the the post film credits, the two scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, the the first one, the main one, that we can talk about. The second one, I think, was just was just done literally specifically for one person on planet Earth, and that was Bobby. <laughs> um, so, what what are your thoughts on the on the, the first post credit scene, Mark? And remind remind the listeners what that was. So the first post credit scene is uh, Charlize Theron. Uh, she's playing a character called, I think it's Aura. No, Clear. I can't remember. Clear. Clear, thank you. So, um, and she comes and she talks to Strange about that there's an incursion happened. And she opens up a portal to the Dark World and they go into it. Um, That's again, where all the magic comes from, for... isn't it? The Dark World, is that right? Yes, okay. exactly, yeah. So spoilers for what might come and what they're building to. Well, no, hold on, you can't spoil so, speculation, Mark. You go for it. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. Okay, fine. Well, happened, I don't want to ruin things for yeah. people. So, yeah. So, an incursion is obviously what we saw in Doctor Strange. But essentially, what an incursion is, is that when someone does the dream walk, which essence is what Strange does at the end of the film, when he possesses the uh, deceased Strange to stop Wanda, and also what Wanda does uh, when she takes over to go to the world with the Illuminati. The other, other Wanda. One, yeah, the other, other Wanda. So what you do is that when you use a dark hold and when you dream walk like that, you bring, although there's like hundreds of thousands of multiverses, you bring those two universes uh, like together and they're kind of like, they're like binded. Like a Venn diagram. Go- yeah, and they're going to keep going, going, going until they explode into each other and then they're both destroyed. Okay, so that's what an incursion is, and that's what we see at the end. So at the end, when we see Strange fighting the old evil Strange uh, towards the end, after they're banished um, uh, by um, um, a mobile Scarlet Witch, they go to a universe that has got an incursion, and that's why you see like the dark greys and the milky blacks that are, like the, the whole universe is just. It's all kind of like bashed so, up and fl- floating around, yeah. isn't it? Basically, this was yeah. Sinister Strange's world. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the result of an incursion. Uh, now, there are ways to get, like, to stop that. Um, so, obviously, Strange has gone with her to do that, and there are different, like, it's comic logic, but there are ways to reverse it, which you can do. But for some, but to the sort of things, so the character that, uh, that Charlize Theron plays actually... Um, is in the comic, she actually gets romantically attached to Strange mm. and they get married. Mm. Uh, so she's actually kind of like the way that he, at the end of this film, when he says that he loves uh, Rachel McAdams' character, it's kind of closure for that. And actually, he do mar- he does marry. Well, I mean, he, fi- he, fixing his well, watch is the whole metaphor for him getting over. Yes. Christine, yes. So, yeah. yeah, Christine, yeah. So he actually marries Charlie Sterling's character Claire, in the comic. Claire? Whether or not the. Claire. Is it Claire? Yeah, Claire yeah. Strange. Yeah. yeah. So whether they do that in the um, in the film, I, I don't know. But she's taking him to the dark, uh, dark like universe yeah. to yeah, dark dimension to solve that. Another thing about her is that her father is Dumaru, and Dumaru was the end villain in the first Doctor Strange film. Which one was that? So was he the was that the big remember, dark dude that in yeah. the, like the yes. big sort of like he had. Um, uh, McCoy Crisp skin, isn't he? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. So when... Uh, how was, she, how was Strange, she her father? How was he produced on like Charlie's Theory? In, in a comic, you don't have to think about the logistics. Yeah. You just you just say, yeah. right, you know, that, that... Oh, yes, his essence, and that's all you have right, to so say. There's, there's no mother. He's kind the of... He's budded to, off, has he, basically? <laughs> yeah, the answer to that is because comics. Because okay, comics. Okay, no, no, no. Fair enough, things. fair enough. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so Damaru is one at, at the end of the first Doctor Strange film where Strange says, I've come to bargain, and he kills Strange in different ways. So that's her father. There's also a theory that Damaru is actually a variant of Strange. Um, now, I, that's, now, that isn't in the comics, but... The reason they're doing that is because Dumaru in... I can't pronounce his name, sorry, excuse me. In the first Doctor Strange film, he was going to be voiced by... Do you know Tony Todd, the old uh, horror actor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was going to be voiced by him, but they changed it at the very end. And actually, Dumaru's voice is actually voiced by Benedict Cumberbatch. Um, So, the idea at the moment is that Dumaru may be a variant of Strange, but I don't know that... Maybe in something to go as wow. well. Okay. So that's so that so there's a lot to unpack there. So a they've got to try and stop this incursion. They might get married, and he may have to deal with like the worst sort of um, like father-in-law ever. So that makes a good story. <laughs> the other part of on incursions as well is that that leads into Secret Wars. Yes. Um, so Secret Wars. And stop me if I'm talking too much. Sorry. No. Secret Wars did, is sep- so. There was two Secret Wars. So there was one in the eighties, uh, but the one that they looks like that they're using for the MCU is the one from 2015. So basically, what it was is that in the comics there was too many universes. So they had like the Ultimates, all the different like universes. So what they did is they did a, a second Secret Wars. And it basically, they used the incursions to create one world called Battle World. 
So what you had then is that you had all the different universes competing with each other to survive. Mm. So you would have the Avengers from one universe against maybe the X-Men of another universe. And I think what they're looking to do for their next Avengers level sort of massive story is I think a few years down the line we're going to get a Secret Wars. And my guess is that we are going to see... Like, whether or not they use the cast from the X-Men films in the Fox universe, but I wouldn't be surprised if we see different versions of all the properties that have existed before fighting each other right. as well. So let's let's talk about um, Phase 4. So we have yeah. Doctor Strange. That's a lot, I know. Doctor Sorry. Strange and the Multiverse of Madness that's come out. We've got Thor, Love and Thunder coming up. We've yes. got Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. That's due, So Thor is July. The new Black Panther film is in November. We've got a TV series, Ms. Ms. Marvel, which I think is coming out this summer. We've got a TV series, She-Hulk. I think it's a TV series. Um, yeah, sure, yeah. We've had Moon Knight. The Secret Wars that you're referring to, is that Secret Invasion? No, no so, they're t- so they're different things. Right. Yeah. Secret, Secret Invasion... I'll come back, hold that thought, I'll come back to that. Yeah, Secret on, Invasion's sorry, coming out this year as well. Then we've got the Guardians yeah. of the Galaxy holiday special in December. Looking forward to that. Uh, the Marvels comes in February of next year. We've got the next volume of Gardens of the Galaxy next year in May. Uh, next July, we have Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. And then unannounced, unannounced date-wise, but announced as in content, we've got Blade and Fantastic Four. Hmm, I wonder who's going to be in the Fantastic Four. So oh, so there's a, there's a lot yes. there. I, I, I would imagine Thor, Love and Thunder is going to be um, parallel to this film with with less of the same people crossing over. Especially from the trailers, um, yeah, no idea what Black Black Panther's going to be like, but I presume they're going to have more of. Um, um, is it Churi? What's the what's his, his, the 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 gadget lady? Churi, is it Ch- Churi? Chowri? What was her name? Chowri. Oh, Churi. Churi, yeah. um, who yeah. was who I watched recently in um, Death on the Nile, and she was very good in that as well. Yes, um, I would imagine Miss Marvel and oh. She Hulk will, will have more of a crossover because She Hulk is yeah. in the House of M, isn't she? Um, she. Uh, well, all the Marvel characters are, but she's quite a smaller character in yeah. that. I actually have a theory about She-Hulk. Mm-hmm. Um, so, to go off of one, because I'm just mindful, there's a bit more of Strange we need to cover as well. But I think She-Hulk is going to be set in the five years between the blip, um, uh, between the snap, and then when everyone comes back. They do when... refer to that in the film just once, don't they, as well, in Doctor Strange? They do yeah. refer to it just once. Yes, at the very start, start yeah. that's right, yeah. yeah. So that's my theory on, on She-Hulk. I think that might take place during the blip. I'm not sure. I don't know nothing about it or what they're doing at the moment. That's just an idea that I've got as well. I think that may that might happen it, on that as so well. So she's basically going to be dealing with all the depressed people who are missing their friends and the family, yeah. basically. I think it may well come to a bit like that, yeah. yeah. If, she, if She-Hulk teams up with Miss America, you've got... Two of the young Avengers. A Force. Oh, A Force. Well, yeah. Ms. Marvel and the young Avengers. A, A Force, right. yeah. So maybe that's what they're so, going for. Maybe. Yeah, so She Hulk is part of A Force, mm-hmm. yes, along with America. And then you've also got the young Avengers, mm-hmm. but we've also already got a lot of the. Aven- we've already got a lot of the young Avengers already. So the young Avengers, so you've got. Um, so Cassie Lang which is Paul Rudd's daughter in oh, Ant-Man right. films, yep. Yep. who is now old, who's basically got older because of Endgame. So she uh, is a uh, so she takes over for him, so she's in it as well. Mm-hmm. You had Hayley Steinfeld, who is Hawkeye, you know, seen the Hawkeye series as well. That's two of them. Actually, Wanda's children are actually in the Young Avengers as well. Oh, right. So, Although I'm not sure how so that, that would work. Like, I don't know how that would... But it could, yeah, it I don't could know work. how they would do it in that. Yeah, it could, it could it, yeah. work in the multiverse piece. Yeah. yeah. And, and then there's the, son, there's the grandson of else. the first um, super soldier serum guy, the black guy that um, Captain... Oh, yes. Yeah, his, in, his, his right. grandson. Yes, it's his grandson, who, who, was also in Win- it was also, yeah, he was also in Winter Soldier as well. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of so crossover got, here. 
Yeah. Yeah, they've got a lot of lines in the sand for that. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just mindful we need to go back to Dr. Strange. We do, yeah. We should really talk talked, about the film. <laughs> we've talked a lot yeah. about, about what's going to happen. Well, let's, okay, I mean, uh, we, 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 we have picked it apart. I mean, there's do, do pitch yeah. if you have some questions. But one thing I'd like to uh, just discuss and how we feel about this is... Wanda is a very, very um, high-powered, super strong uh, Avenger. And at the end of the film, she appears to be crushed by Wonder Gore, mm-hmm. the mountain above her. Now, do you believe that she is dead? We don't see her body. We don't see her die. Do you, you know, already, um, and spoilers for Moon Knight, if you've not seen Moon Knight. Have you all seen Moon Knight? Mm. Yes. Yeah. We, we, spoilers we for all Moon have. Knight, the, yeah. the, the MCU has <laughs> pretty much established that people can come back from the dead, if need be. So... Um, do you think she's dead and gone, or do you think they're going to keep her going in future films? That's my first question. I think, I think she's dead, Alex. personally. I, because the thing is, I, I saw the spark of red when, um, uh, when it, you know, when it when it collapsed. I saw that as an indicator that she had gone. But you could just as easily use that as an indicator for she has gone somewhere else. Yeah, uh, that that that's all all open for Marvel to retcon later on. I expect. Do you think? But yeah. do you think Marvel want her as a an antagonist for another film, though, or or has she has she seen the error of her ways and she's now going to be one of the good guys? What do you think? I think she's so overpowered that if you would see her, it would be right at the culmination, like rather Captain Marvel. Than, yeah, thing. because because if you saw her any earlier than that. It would be that like it would be the Captain Marvel problem where it's like why didn't Captain Marvel just just uh, kick kick them out of the 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 world and it's like oh yeah fair point so yeah um, I feel like that okay. that story piece is is done now so I think the only way she can come back is um uh like right at the end perhaps with Agatha so perhaps perhaps Agatha isn't Agatha getting something. her own series as well she is yes right yeah. So we may see her in that. Yeah. They may bring her back for that more than anything else as a sort of cameo. Yeah. Um, secondly. I don't think she's dead. No, you oh, don't. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, Mark. We should have asked your opinion. You, you don't think she no, is? No, that's right. No, I don't think she is. I, I, there's an argument maybe this variant of her is dead if they want to close that off. Mm. So they may go that stage. But I also know that Elizabeth Olsen signed a new contract with Marvel. Oh, well, there you go. It was, then. In, it, was, it, was, it was in the news, I think, last year or whatever it was. So I think they would need her, like especially when they're bringing in the X-Men and that sort of thing as well. But I don't think you'll see her for uh, the next couple of years as well. A, like, because Elizabeth Olsen has just done one division and this film will probably want a break and a holiday. And also she probably is a really great actress. So I'm sure there's other sort of things chance to explore as well. So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't be surprised if like Wonder's given a bit of a break for a few years and then she comes back. Okay. You, so you, it, you mentioned the X Men. You mentioned the X Men, uh, and we see mm. um, Charles Xavier in this film, um, Sir Patrick okay. Stewart, and you know that was a kind of a given. We'd see, we'd, we'd heard his voice in the trailers. Um, is Patrick Stewart getting too old to be usable as Xavier in future films? And do you think they'll probably do uh, an X Men film with all new actors, new cast uh, in, the, in the roles of perhaps like like uh, Wolverine and Charles uh, Charles Xavier? Are we because uh, you, you yeah. mentioned the X Men's coming at some point? Now they own the property. Mm. Do you think we're going to see a, a, a completely revamped cast for those films? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think that in terms of Patrick Stewart, I love Patrick Stewart. Like who doesn't like? So many fantastic roles that he's done. I did think he looked quite old. In could this could film. James McC- McAvoy do it? Could he come back to reprise that role? Yeah. Do you think with with so this head is, shaved? So what I actually think is that is that Kevin Feige has said that he's got no. The X Men will come back at some stage. I think there's been a good amount of time between the last film, Dark Phoenix, which came out about three or four years ago, which was terrible. I th- I think what they will have what will happen actually is that we will is is both will happen. When I talked about Secret Wars a minute ago about the different universes, it would not surprise me if the actors from the Fox X Men films came back. So your McAvoy, maybe a fast bender, um, a few of the other minor ones, maybe they come back and maybe are killed off in Secret Wars. And I think maybe once Secret Wars does whatever. Favorite it does 
and reboots the universe, I think then you'll get your brand new X-Men. So, so actually different different superheroes, but they're still the X-Men. Yeah, I don't think that... I could be completely wrong. This is only guesswork from me. Um, I, I don't know anything for sure. But I would be surprised if we get a new X-Men film before Secret Wars. I think they may use them characters in Secret Wars and do whatever they want with them. But I think you they'll completely like recast the whole X Men after that as well. Because I I don't see Michael Voy and Fast Bender and the other and, uh, and and Nicholas Holt wanting to carry on in those films either. But certainly to come back for like cameo or, or like a part of one film, I think they would do that. But then I think they will then recast as well. Okay. And of course that and then obviously the big question is about Jackman as well. So yeah. Mm. Do you have do either of you have any more thoughts or questions about Doctor Strange? Because I've got one more question for you before we finish um, in this episode do you have any more thoughts or questions about the film itself so um i yeah my question is is how do you think that the they wrapped up strange's arc because obviously you know it's still a doctor strange film even if a lot a lot happens with other characters so uh do you think do you think that the 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 watch was enough or do you think because i i loved the way that i love the way um that uh, Rachel McAndrews' uh, character Christine Palmer said that you always had to, you always had to hold the knife like that was always your your flaw, um, mm. and I felt like that arc was really nicely like explained and and shown how it would it would change, um, but it'd be interesting to see if that's is that enough for Strange, like are we are we done with him or is there going to be more to it because uh, you know we could come back and do the same film again but it wouldn't wouldn't work so we'd have to have something new to say no i think they kind of address that at the end of the film so after like they defeat um wanda yeah. then obviously we have that scene then the very last shot of the film before the um uh the post credits is he has that like serian pain in the third eye comes uh, out doesn't it so, as he's, well. so he has so got that, more to tell then yeah yeah so they see in the dark hole okay. as well and i I think in regards to the character himself, I think he's a lot, a lot more mature now. So certainly he come across as quite an arrogant person as well, mm-hmm. maybe a bit cold, which is strange in the comics to a degree. I think they've done that. And I think it's also with the character, I think it's like strange in the comics is like the, like one of the most smartest people in the world. He's kind of like an Xavier and a Reed Richards. And a bit like with what Chris Evans did with Captain America, it's kind of hard to keep playing the same things. So what they do is they reinvent it and add different layers to it. Like with Evans, it was about, you know, a reconciliation between being in the Second World War to being present day. Mm-hmm. And I think what they did really well with Strange's character in this is that he comes off as quite arrogant and a bit of a douche uh, in his own film, I think, and also like in Infinity War and to a lesser degree Endgame and a little bit of Spider-Man. So you can send that arrogant streak in him as well. But I think the scene at, at the end scene when he tells Christine that he loves her and he loves every version of her and and the watch as well and, and what he's been through, I think he becomes a bit more humble in that as well. So I think, and also I think the plans for Cumberbatch and the character is I think he's kind of going to be a little bit of a replacement for like Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Mm-hmm. Like, not the leader, but I think he'll be like like the senior sort of like character in it as well. I think that's where they're going with him. Mm-hmm. So I think they've, I think he actually, like, considering you could argue this is a wonder film, mm. plus all the cameos, which we've got to talk about very quickly as well, I actually think there's actually quite a good amount of development for Strange in this as well. And it's something different for Cumberbatch to do because, you know, in this film, he does what four different versions of himself as there's well. There's Defender think. Strange, the Sinister Strange, Defender Strange, himself, his characters, or oh, maybe it's a three then. Oh, and Dead Strange, you could argue, but that's the same Sinister Strange, isn't it? Yeah. So, and that must be quite enjoyable as an actor, I suppose, to be able to do different sort of parts to a character. So I think they've got to revolve him to keep the actors interested. A bit like, you know, a bit like Liz Olsen with Wonder going forward as well, you know. But I think that's what they're planning for him. Okay. Let, but no, I, I, I really have been... Let's, let's, the let's, let's finish off by talking about the cameos. Yes. Um, when we were in the cinema, every time these cameos appear, there's a ripple of applause throughout the cinema. I think yes. there was one groan. What was it for? There was one groan about something. I remember everyone going, oh, for goodness sake. What was it? Can you remember what it was, Alex? 
there was something oh, there. I, can't. Mm. I can't remember mm. what it was now. I'll come back to that. I'll have to think about that. But um, okay. Tell me, tell me what your thoughts about the cameos, Alex. So I got most of them. Um, I didn't get all of them because, um, yeah. So I didn't. I didn't get all of them because I'm not um, that much of a Sam Raimi f- uh, fanboy. So I did. I didn't. I. I missed some of the re- really obvious ones. Um, but yeah, no. I just think the nods were just were just really good. Um, I think the. Yeah, the biggest was Reed Richards. We got a good because we we saw it in Leicester Square, and mm. there were really good crowd up there on the Friday night, and um, it, you know there was cheering and hey and oh, you know it was, it was it was really interesting to to hear them hear them do it, um, and the biggest cheer was uh, uh, Reed Richards, and I think everyone's quite quiet about Patrick Stewart. I think we'd kind of got that. We knew that was coming. Mm. Um, Mm. So I think I think that was it, and and a few for Black Bolt were just like, huh? Because they didn't, they obviously weren't big enough comic fans. They didn't know who who <laughs> was. Um, well, Black and, Bolt yeah, was in. He, I I read the Black the humans, um, yeah. Christian Ward uh, drawn Black Bolt comic, which was excellent. Um, and uh, interestingly, and we were all asking about this in our last podcast, who played Black Bolt. Can you answer Mount? It's Mount. it's it's, it's uh, Christopher Pike. Yeah. Um, but he actually yeah. played Black Black Bolt in the short series. Was it the Inhumans? Yeah, limited yeah. series Inhumans. I don't know if they're right, the same yeah. Black Bolt. I think he might be an alternate universe one. But he's a different one. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, because in this, yes, he's uh, he's comic accurate costume yeah. in this. And he's, he's got the tuning fork as yeah. well at the front, which mm. he doesn't have. Mm. So yeah. The biggest one of the big so, cheers was about. Um, uh it was uh was it captain britain captain yeah captain um britain yeah oh yeah so i think that was another yeah. one um or captain carter as they put captain it down carter, that's yeah, it. captain yeah. carter yeah. Yeah. so captain i think that carter, was yeah. that was a big but i think because it, it was a big uh surprise because it it was so close to how i mean obviously it was they they probably knew who they cast when they did what if so they could they, yeah. they basically were like great we'll we'll just go and get pictures and and well, her voice was used for what if wasn't it as well yeah so yes that's right. it was yeah so uh, this is it there wasn't a mistake that they linked them together um but it, yeah so it's just so well done it's just those little things are really nice things the bruce campbell cameo was nice for those that recognized yeah, yeah. it um so i think that that was funny and obviously, why I, why he was why his hand was possessed was the main thing. That was good. Is he? That's an Evil Dead, obviously, yeah, as well. Which Sam, who Sam Raimi directed? Um, yeah, Maria Rambo. She was Captain Marvel, wasn't she? Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was quite a cool. Nod yeah. as well, I thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's like a what if you know she like was in yeah. the plane to the Carol. So yeah, that was cool. Um, and then um, obviously we've got the the variants of Doctor Strange as well, which are dealt with in the film, but. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I mean, John Kransky is really big. I know. I mean, so this is good. Great. Obviously, obviously, so we, 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 we've got the Fantastic Four, and that 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 franchise absolutely deserves a good film. Yes, um, yeah, it does. And I think I hope he directs it. Well, I think with Kevin Feige, you know, as as the auteur now for the for the whole franchise, I think I think um, we can be optimistic about that, can't we? Yeah, um, I want John Kransky as Reed Richards, and I want Emily Blunt as Sue Storm. <laughs> That would be that would be perfect. That would be great. I went mad. With only like, I went to a not only if she, if she comes falling out of a plane or something, holding onto a bit of rope. She says, "I'm Mary Poppins, you all." Because <laughs> yes. that, that would work. That's very it? meta, wouldn't it? It would work. Yeah. I went to a nine thirty in the morning screening of this, and I went a little bit mad when Ree Richards come out, John Kransky, and like everyone else looked to me as if it was a bit weird. So this is problem. Was this sorry? Was this your emotional outburst for each Marvel film? Because obviously you cried in the light in Endgame. Yes. So this is your new like your new. Like, mo- allegedly cried at Endgame. <laughs> <laughs> so so this was your emotional outburst for this film when you saw Ree Richards. When I saw John Kransky, because yeah. I'm a big fan of him. Yeah. Uh, as Ree Richards, yes, I did go big fanboy as well because much like I said in our chat before we did this as well, like he has been like a fan casting for like a fan fantasy casting for years. There's loads of mock-ups of him dressed as Reed Richards as well. And it just makes perfect sense. And um, he's always said he wanted to 
I like, I like joining the MCU because he actually auditioned for Captain America all those years ago as well. It was, uh, also, a bit of trivia, but he's perfect as Reed Richards. I mean, what, and, um, what's exciting about about seeing both um, Reed Richards and Xavier in this film is it's their hmm. first Marvel Universe appearance, isn't it? Yes, I think Xavier with Patrick Stewart. So, so the Xavier in in the film is very much influenced by the X Men animated series. Right. Uh, from the early nineties, the With yellow, his yellow chair, chair the green you mean? yeah, right, yeah, and the green suit as well. Yeah. So that was part of the reboot in the early nineties when they rebooted the X Men. For me, I think the Patrick Stewart uh, uh, the cameo in this, I think it's a one and done. I yeah. don't think you'll see him again. I think it's a bit of a closure on it. A nice little Easter egg for everyone, but I I would be surprised if you see him again. So- because we've seen Xavier die three times now in films. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so I think that was a one and done, probably, I, yeah. I, I imagine. I do think also the other thing is Patrick Stewart's getting on a bit. Yeah, um, that's what I've mentioned before. And I've yeah. seen, I've, I saw him in Picard. Um, he's done an, an one more series of Picard, but it was filmed back to back. Yeah, so, I mean, he, he suffers terribly mm. from vertigo now. Yeah. Um, and struggle with any sort of cat, catwalks or walkways in whilst filming Picard. Um, yeah. mm. And I think that's why... He was quite happy to sit in a wheelchair for this episode, this, this filming. Um, yeah. And I think personally, I'd like to finish finish off, you know, see him as he was in Logan. I think that was just a perfect yeah. film yes, for his character. You know, it makes sense yeah. that he's losing his mind and that affects people. But um, I think we need to finish off there, gents. Um, mm-hmm. I'm looking, obviously, just, just the final thoughts, final uh, simple word answer. What are your general feelings for the MC universe at the moment, Alex? Um, well, uh, currently it's on fire. There's a lot. There's a lot going right about it. Um, they're also doing a really good job of completely revitalizing it. So I think that's really, um, mm. really good for for um, Marvel. And I think Disney Plus has really given it. Um, you know, yes, yes, budget, but also it's 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 given it a a place for telling the stories that wouldn't necessarily work, or uh, as a film. Um, and you and know, sometimes if you, showing things as a TV series that should be a film. Well, there, you know, it doesn't always get them right. But like yeah. Moon Moon Knight, for example, I couldn't see that working as a film, but I can see it working as a as a TV series. Mm. So I, I and yeah. I think I think that's the thing: getting that kind of buzz about stuff. And then linking it into stuff so that it makes sense, and you go, "Ah, oh, great! That's really that. That's how it works." That really is where where Marvel's doing so well at the moment. So I'm really happy with that. Cracking one word answer there, Mark. Uh, yeah. Alex. Thank you very much. Now, Mark, <laughs> give give me your one word thoughts uh, on uh, the MCU <laughs> universe. How you feel so far? I mean, <laughs> excited is definitely one word, but like, I want to do a quick. I would say risk taking is also a word as well. I like that they're taking risks because we haven't talked about the horror element in this as well. There's some mm. great little sort of like scare, like jump scares in this, and the bit when Wanda tries to get in in the sanctum and she does that that crawling thing, like the thing out of the film with the TV. The ring. Um, the ring. Yes, yes. So there's some great little Raimi hol- uh, uh, like a horror elements in this. So I like the risk taking in this. Like, I like Moonlight, the way it was structured was a risk as well. And I think you could argue that something like Loki with the multiverse stuff was a risk. Mm. So I like the risk taking. And I think they've really gone, you know, like after like having Evans and I like Danny Jr. fronting it for so long, they've really gone, you know, it'd be very easy just to do new versions of those characters. And yes, we've got Sam as Captain America now. I know that. And we are getting Iron Heart, but they are actually looking at other characters now. They're not just rehashing stuff; they're taking risks, mm. and I like that. Like some of the ratings, like a lot of people don't like this film, which I just do not understand. Like people like have been moaning that it's not actually very good. I think it's like for me, this is like top tier Marvel. I think this is definitely going to be my like top ten of films. I was very much blown away by watching it on a very good quality screen with very good quality sound. I think, I think a lot of people have got used to watching films at home or on low quality devices because they have to be at home and for me I think I'm slightly influenced by how amazing an experience it was in general to see it at the cinema but at a, you know at a mm. high tier cinema as well and I think that's where these films really shine um, and why perhaps we see so many of the big blockbuster films becoming successful because the cinema really shows them off 
Um, mm. One last question then. And again, just a yes or no answer for this one. Do you think that the MCU will ever have an 18 rated film? Mark? Yeah, I think it will. Alex? Yeah. I think it's working towards that slowly. Yeah. But this yeah. is this is a, an important step because this was a much more mature film mm. than perhaps some of the others. So taking an 11 year old do- uh, daughter to this. There it's, were bits that I was like, "Oh, actually, maybe I shouldn't have done that." It's it's a twelve A, not a twelve. Is it twelve A? Well, it's a twelve A. You're allowed. Yeah, you're, I you're spoke, allowed. Well, it's a twelve A. A twelve A means uh, twelve twelve year olds can see it, but um, advice from the parents about it beforehand, i.e., the parent can decide if they don't go to it. Does that make sense? It's an advisory twelve. Mm. Yes. Yeah. That's a. right. Yeah. It, it, basically, you can invite any anyone can see it. But it, that's the that's the, the age they're aimed at, and honestly, yeah. I could see it if they'd have done a cut with more blood uh, and and, 15, and, a, and a couple of extra cuts yeah. on certain bits. It could have been a fifteen. Yeah, I've got one question. Sorry, before we wrap up as well. So, uh, was anybody surprised we didn't see Vision at all in this? No, he wasn't surprised. No, because if she mm. if he turned up, it would have ruined the whole motivation for Wonder, wouldn't it? In a flashback, mm. yeah, but maybe that was well, we like the, great yeah. vision, perhaps. Well, or... I'm just saying, just because obviously the white vision at the end oh, of one division kind of like flies off, doesn't he? So, I thought, I thought it's a little bit strange not to have at least one scene of vision in it, but mm. you know, I guess you didn't need it. Okay, um, and obviously, uh, if you want to listen to us um, again and again, or find us uh, discussing things like this on Twitter or, or Mastodon. Um, uh, you can find uh, Alex at Alex Hansford. Uh, you can find me at, at John P. R. Evans. Uh, and if you want to find out what um, Bobby is thinking about our podcast right now, you can go to It's Bobby Rivilla. Uh, Mark, you're not on Twitter, um, but you are on Instagram, aren't you? So if you want to see um, Mark posing posing in his um, influencer clothes and poses, um, <laughs> yeah, check him out on Instagram uh, at uh, I am a Marvel fan. I think that's his uh, Instagram handle. <laughs> um, uh, and finally, you can see you can actually go to a web version of the uh, podcast player at eight, at playpausedturn dot show. Well, we've we've picked apart uh, Doctor Strange, I think, quite quite uh, successfully. Like, I think we've gutted the fish right down to the uh, backbone here. Um, so I hope you, hope you've enjoyed listening. I've definitely enjoyed um, learning a bit more about the Marvel Universe from uh, from Mark and Alex. So thank you very much, gents. Um, this has been uh, Playpause Turn, and thank you for listening. Boys, I'm so sorry. My KFC's just arrived. I'm really <laughs> have to stop. I'm so sorry. Le- just stay sorry recording, mate. Priorities. Stay recording. Okay. Yeah, I will. I'm just give me two seconds. Go to the front door. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm professional. I apologise. One moment. That's all right. I can mark the time. Don't worry. Keep recording, though. We'll come back to it. <laughs> That's typical. We've not, had a, we've not had a KFC during a podcast before, have we? No, it's fair enough. But see, now um, I want KFC. I've already had dinner, so I really don't need a KFC. But I had macaroni and cheese tonight. Oh, that's nice. No, with that's uh, good. onions and lardons in it. So it was Lovely. No, yeah. that's very nice. Right. Uh, how are we going to do this, Mark? Are you going to eat first before it goes cold? No, 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 it's fine. I will just say my bit and then I'll let Alex and I'll like mute. Don't worry, it'll be fine. It's okay. <laughs>